All right, this is the last lecture before your exam. And so we are going to go over the John Adams administration. Uh, this should be pretty short compared to Washington. So let us begin. All right, so remember that uh, in 1796, George Washington, not wanting to be viewed as a king, sort of retired from public service. And that meant that we were going to have a new president uh, come in. And that happened to be John Adams. Now, let me fast forward here just a second or go back. And so if you take a look at the screen, you can see that and this really marks the beginning of political parties and political division. In 1792, when George Washington was reelected, he basically got all of the electoral votes. But then as you kind of fast forward to 1796 and you look at Adams's election, you can see that there's there's a split, basically kind of a fit, almost a 50 50 split with with Adams barely being elected. Um, you know, he represented the, you know, the north and the northeast, the bigger cities on the east coast. And Jefferson definitely was the uh, backcountry and southern and western candidate. And so that would be a trend that's going to continue and it will become more and more polarized uh, into like a, a north south divide as we as we move on up until the 1800s. OK. Now, <clears throat> most of Adams uh, presidency and it's only four years, so he only served one term. Uh, but most of his term has to do with uh, foreign policy events. And so we're going to start with what was called the XYZ affair. Now, remember from last time we talked about how when the French Revolution was going on, um, it became kind of a, an ugly thing. And so some of the other countries around Europe, including, including England, really worried about this. And they did not want that kind of revolution spreading to their country. And so they declared war on France to try to, to, try to put down this uh, riotous, uh, you know, democratic, so to speak, uh, movement. And that involved us. And so at one point we were about to go to war with Britain because they were seizing our ships when we try to trade to France. Uh, they were impressing our sailors. And so we end up making the Jays, Jays Treaty between Britain. And that kind of took care of the, the hostilities with Britain. However, France is different. Um, you know, France, they were doing the same thing. They were seizing our cargo whenever we would try to trade with Great Britain. And there were a lot of people, uh, you know, in the, the, the pro-British side. So like Hamilton would be a good example of this. Uh, Pinckney would be a good example of this. John Jay, these are people that are strong Federalists and they are pretty much anti-French. And they wanted to go to war with French, with the French. Now, John Adams, he's kind of like a, you know, he's kind of like Washington where he's kind of a moderate. Uh, even though he was definitely for the powers of the Constitution, uh, he was not about to go get us into a war with France. And so what really happens is that we start to develop a navy. Um, we use that navy to start this what's called the quasi war. And so it's an undeclared war with France and it's mostly a naval war. There's not really any land fighting between us and, Fr and France. And Adams dispatches some a uh, couple of diplomats, including the future Chief Justice John Marshall, to go to France and to try to negotiate a, a peace settlement with France. And when they get there, the French are just terrible to them. They they hardly will speak to them. Um, they will only even negotiate. They, they, they won't even agree to anything, but they'll only negotiate if we bribe them first. And so, uh, you know, the famous quote that comes out of here is no, no, not a sixpence. And then it blows up into the papers in America uh, to millions for the de defense, but not a cent for tribute. And like I said, after after this so-called XYZ affair and, and XYZ means the, the three diplomats that we um, that we were, you know, that we were. Um, they, they wanted us to bribe them. So those three ministers were uh, people of France that wanted us to bribe them and we just would not do it. And so instead of their names in the papers, they were referred to as uh, French minister X, Y, and Z. And that's why it's called the X, Y, Z, Z affair. But again, the, the, the biggest outcomes of this X, Y, Z affair is this quasi war with France. 
where we're fighting them out on the high seas and um, the, the creation of the United States Navy. All right, so you have a, a bunch of people who are uh, in control of the government and they are Federalists and you have a bunch of people that are upset that we are in this quasi war with France and they are Republican. Um, John Adams makes one of the biggest mistakes uh, of his presidency domestically when he allows the Alien and Sedition Acts to be to be passed by Congress. And so this is done. The Alien and Sedition Acts are passed by the Federalists in hopes of kind of uh, diminishing the power of the Republicans and also to silence the Republicans opposition to um, our, our war with France. And so I'll just kind of talk about those briefly. So the alien acts have to do with limiting uh, immigrants, how they, how they come into the country. So before you could become a citizen in five years, so you live here for five years and then you could become an American citizen, then you could vote, you know, especially if you owned property. And what this did is it increased the requirement from five to 14 years. And so there were three separate alien acts and all of them had one thing in common. And that was most of these people that, they, that were immigrants, they ended up when they became voters, they became Republicans. And the Federalists saw this as a threat to their power. And so if they eliminate these people from being able to be able to vote, then that would keep them in power. The second thing they do, and, and arguably even you know more, uh, you know more malicious and more uh, really corrupt and unethical, was the pass uh, passage of the Sedition Acts. And the Sedition Acts, this the the heart of the Sedition Act was it made it illegal for people to to criticize and to uh, impugn the the reputation of. Uh, the government, and in particular, then for federal. So, in other words, you couldn't criticize, uh, you know, you couldn't criticize the government. And so, for example, one of the guys uh, that was a Republican, he joked publicly that he wished that a cannon would uh, shoot a cannonball and hit John Adams in the rear. And uh, he he was actually put in jail for that. And uh, you know, this is something that we kind of hold near and dear to our hearts in America that that you're able to criticize the government. Well, here was a time where we made a mistake. Uh, John Adams allowed the passage of these two discriminatory laws. And as it turned out, it would, you know, it would lead to his doom. Uh, this is something he was looked back at as a mistake. He should not have agreed to them, should not have signed them into law. And, uh, you know, eventually we get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, but this is kind of a, a bad couple of laws that we made. All right, so Jefferson and Madison, they start to speak out against the Alien and Sedition Acts, and they bring up this idea of nullification uh, and, and really this idea of interposition that if, a, if the federal government makes a law that is unjust and unconstitutional, and in other words, breaks the social compact between the, the national government and the state governments, that the states have a right to interpose, uh, to to um, you know, speak out against it, and then if they agree to it, then they could what's called nullify, which means get rid of the law. So this would, you know, this would give states kind of almost like the final authority in terms of if the national government makes a law, do they really have to follow it? And so we're going to see this idea of nullification come come up again and again as we get up closer to the Civil War. But for right now. Um, we don't we don't end up seeing you know these southern states or these these western states nullify the alien and sedition acts and really what ends them more is just that the republicans will end up winning the election of 1800 and they will get rid of the alien and sedition acts but again the virginia and kentucky resolutions we're going to come back to this idea of nullification of do the states have a right to get rid of laws that the federal government makes if they feel they're unjust and unfair all right. Well, this about does it for John Adams. Uh, he's going to end up losing the election of 1800. And um, we're going to see new leadership come in under Jefferson. But before he left, uh, the, the Federalists made a last kind of really minute or last ditch effort to ensure that uh, their power would be maintained throughout the years. Because 
this would be the last election, 1796, that a Federalist would ever win the presidency. And so the, the Federalists are kind of coming down while the, while the Republicans are coming up. And uh, so John Adams is the last of the Federalist presidents elected. But before he goes, he is able with Congress to create several new justice ships. Uh, and remember that he is the one that gets to appoint those federal court officers. And so he does this. And, there, you know, there's there's well over uh, 10 of these people that are that are put in. And then um, the other thing that he does is that he gets to name the new Supreme Court justice, who is John Marshall, a man that is going to be synonymous with the Elastic Clause, what we call judicial review, and just overall the increase of the power of the federal government, much to the chagrin of the Republicans. And he does this kind of at the last minute. Uh, the, the story is, is that he was signing the paperwork for the justices right up until midnight when he was going to be officially out of office. So these are called... Uh, the, the midnight justices. And again, these were going to be, this is how the Federalists were going to kind of stay in power, even though they would never get elected again uh, as a president. Okay, really quickly, I'm just going to go over this because I already did this in class, but just remember as 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 Adams and uh, Jefferson's coming in, you really get this solidification of political parties and just remember, you know, kind of what they're all about. So remember the Federalists, they they're, they're led by Alexander Hamilton. They favored a strong central government. They want to use the necessary and proper clause, the so-called elastic clause that allows them broad or loose interpretation of the Constitution. This gives them more power for the national government. Uh, it's composed of the wealthy. So you got bankers, merchants, artisans, uh, creditors. You have speculators, people like that. And they're located primarily in the north and the east. And you saw that reflected in the election. These guys tended to be pro-British. They, they favored the Bank of the United States. They favored the tariff. Um, they favored assumption of debt. And, uh, you know, they're backed again by Hamilton. They, they, their vision for America is a manufacturing powerhouse. They want to be like England. They want to uh, have uh, the South and the, the West be the people that buy their manufactured goods. Uh, but they want to, you know, they want to unleash America's manufacturing spirit and potential. Okay, the Democratic Republicans are led by Thomas Jefferson and, to a lesser degree, James Madison. They, fit, of course, favored a strong central government, but weaker, a weaker version than what the Federalists wanted. They believed the vast majority of the powers of government should be in, uh, held by the state, so they held true to the, the, the what, we, what we call the Reserved Rights Amendment for the states, the Tenth Amendment. And they did not like the use of the Elastic Clause and believed that we should have strict interpretation of the Constitution. Now, they're composed of middle and lower class people, primarily, uh, you know, farmers in the back country, Scots, Irish, uh, you know, the, the South and the West is what makes up the, the primary voting base of the Democratic Republicans. And whereas, you know, the, the Federalists favored the British, the DRs, the Republicans, they favored the French. And instead of an industrial manufacturing society, uh, Jefferson promoted this agrarian kind of decentralized uh, place where we didn't have a lot of cities. All right, to finish up the election of 1800. Okay, so this is a very contentious election. Um, you know, by this time, the gloves are off between not only Hamilton and uh, Madison and Jefferson, but really Adams and Jefferson, who had been very much friends and, and uh allies during the Revolutionary War period, now they are, now they're pretty much enemies and they'll stay enemies until both are retired and both are very old. And then they kind of resume a friendship. But uh, during the election of 1800, they're not really seeing eye to eye. Now, m most of the, most of the scandalous stuff is done by underlings. It's not actually done by them, but this is where we really start to see some mudslinging going on politically. For example, uh, the Federalists found out about uh, Jefferson's affair with uh, one of his slaves, and he actually ended up, uh, you know, having several children with Sally Hemings, one of his slaves, and that information got out to the public, and so they tried to smear him to do that. Okay, by the this, this is one of the the most interesting presidential elections because at the at the time the rules were such that. You would vote as an elector, you would vote for basically two people and whoever got the first amount of votes, whoever got the most first place votes 
would, I'm sorry, you wouldn't vote for two people. You would vote and whoever the first and second place person was would become president and vice president. And so, you know, if, if, you know, Jefferson got first and Adams got second, then Jefferson would be the president and uh, Adams would be the vice president. And so really the, the game was you not only wanted to get your party to have the guy that was first, but also second. And so that's, and, and really the Republicans were able to do that. The problem was uh, that they tied. And so Thomas Jefferson and his running mate, Aaron Burr of New York, they actually got the same amount of votes. And so under the, the rules of the Constitution, if this ever happens where there's a tie in the Electoral College, the vote goes to the House of Representatives. And uh, the House of Representatives at this time is, is controlled by the Federalists. So they kind of have the weird position of um, the opposition party is going to become, you know, one of them is going to become president, but they get to choose which one. So basically they pick the one that they hate the least. And so that is Jefferson. So they actually voted like 35 times. And then on the 36th time, um, you know, they worked it out to where Jefferson would win. And that's how Jefferson becomes president. Now, oftentimes the election of 1800 is called the Revolution of 1800. And uh, what's revolutionary about it is that we have a changing of political power. And so we go from having one ruling group to the other, but we need to add that it was it was peaceful, and and that's been a hallmark of American elections, really, other than the election of 1860 that signified the beginning of the secessionist movement for the South. Uh, for the most part, America, for as big of a country as we are and as long of a history as we've had, we've really had pretty peaceful transfer of power. Okay, after this election, because it was such a debacle in terms of having a president and a vice president, they created the 12th Amendment. And this just says that each presidential candidate will name a running mate. And then whomever you, you know, whoever the elector votes for, you're really voting for the lead person on the ticket. And then if that person wins, then you just get the vice president. So you don't get to vote for vice president, technically speaking, anymore. All right, so here is the election of 1800. Uh, you can see that, again, we are very polarized. We're very divided. You've got the Federalists winning in virtually all of the northeastern states, the Atlantic seaboard states, the ones with the big cities, and then anything, um, you know, pretty much in the south and the west. That was uh, people that voted for Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. Okay, that ends our lecture on uh, John Adams, and that should get you ready for the test. Don't forget to study your key term cards. Don't forget to read chapter six. I would suggest that you do the review guide on the key terms and any of the review charts that you think will help you. Good luck, and please email me.